For Kumi Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai, visiting assistant professor of history and African studies at St. Lawrence University. Billy Kingston joins me to unpack his book titled African Spies and the Revolutionary Underground. Apartheid Spies and the Revolutionary Underground is the first book-length account of the assassination of Jeanette Schoon and her young daughter Catherine Schoon, ordered by a member of the Apartheid Services, Craig Williamson. So what were the circumstances of their killing in Angola in 1984? The things we know for sure are that the Schoon family had left South Africa in 1977. They were in Botswana for about six years and then they went to a city called Lubango in the south of Angola. And there they were teaching at a, a teacher's college, training other teachers and teaching English. So a package arrived at the, the mail came to the work. And so the package arrived at the college and Jeanette took it home with her two children. The father was away. He was in Luanda in the capital. And there's many different versions. I mean, uh, I, in trying to learn the story of the assassination, I was told many different specific versions of who was where when the bomb went off, why did the bomb go off, and so forth. So it get, begins to get complicated, but what we're sure is that the, the bomb exploded and it killed Jeanette and it killed Katrin, and this two-year-old boy named Fritz uh, survived mm -hmm. somehow the bombing. They were living in an apartment building, which was all for teachers from other countries that had come to teach there in Angola. And the apartment building was very badly damaged. They talked about the, the glass shattering down from the fourth floor to the street below and so forth. So it was quite a large blast, I think. And why do you think the school story has not been spoken of in the books that cover the armed struggle or the ANC? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One way to look at it is that, and this is a lot of what the book is dealing with, is is what really was their role and, and how central was their role to the movement. And I think their story is a little more complicated than other people's in a certain way because they were involved in many different things. So they were teachers there, they were teachers in Botswana, they were also involved in trade union work, they were part of the Medu Arts Ensemble, they were part of a news organization in Botswana called Solidarity News Service. They did a lot of trade union work, Jenny came through the trade union movement. So where do you place them? And then different people said, okay, but maybe also they were working with Mkonto Wisizwe in different ways. There's a lot of debate around that, contestation around that. So it's not easy to place them exactly, to say, okay, this is exactly who they were. They were a, a soldier for MK or something, and then it's straightforward, and you know what you want to say about it. It's that confusion and the complication of their lives and where to, we, we've kind of gotten into a way of talking about the anti-apartheid struggle that's very narrow in, in a certain way. There's a story of the ANC and there's like outside of the ANC it's a, it becomes foggier to talk about and uh, there's a story of the armed struggle and then outside of that it becomes more confusing. Talk to us more about the research for this book. I mean I understand the book is built on more than five years of prior research to the topic. Yes, so the goal of the book is to try and make sense of that bombing by going backwards. So we know exactly who committed the murder because he confessed to it and received amnesty at the TRC, but, but why? We don't know why. So I was trying to trace backwards. Originally I thought maybe I could go back 20 years backwards, but I ended up going back about 12 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, you know, and I'm following the path that the family went also. So I went to Botswana, I went to Angola, and in Botswana they were working for a British peace organization called International Voluntary Service. So I spent time in the UK, I spent time in the archives in Lisbon learning about what's happening in Angola. And I'm following also, so Craig Williamson is, is moving in their world for those whole 12 years. You know, he arrives here at the Witz campus in 1972. Uh, he's at that time already working for the police, but he's presenting himself as a student radical and he becomes part of the student movement. And Jeanette is here, also in Johannesburg at that time, and they're crossing paths at, at that moment. He goes into exile at the same time that they go into exile, and he's also saying, he arrives in Botswana, and he's also saying, look, I'm, I'm, I need asylum, apartheid's terrible, I have to get away from it. 
and he gets a job in Geneva at an organization that funds the anti-apartheid struggle. And so, so the papers for that organization, the International University Exchange Fund, mostly gave scholarships to African students to study abroad. Those papers are in Copenhagen, so I also went up to Copenhagen to do that research there. And I'm not even discussing all the different archives that I did here in South Africa and more than 20 different interviews with people spread out all over. Talking about Craig Williamson, what were his objectives in escalating the conflict between the schools and the state? He's a very particular person within the apartheid state, I think, because, okay, he's a white supremacist, you could say, but not, not in the way that you might imagine, like a shrieking race hater. That's not how he presents himself. He, pre he wants to present himself as like calm, rational, and that he's doing a job. He also never tries to say that apartheid, at the ideological level, he doesn't try to say that it was good. He tries to say, my job was to keep apartheid going. That apartheid lasted so long because of the security services. Because we were willing to do the work that we did, we kept the system going for a longer time. Uh, he hated communism. He's very open about he absolutely hated communism. And he imagined that it would be in the best interest for the apartheid state if, if they could push the entire movement against apartheid and call all of them communists. He called it the, the Moscow line. If we can prove that the whole movement is adopting the Moscow line, he knew that if the South African government wanted to get support from overseas and they want to talk about the master race or something like that, uh, it wasn't going to go very well. But if they talked about fighting communism, they could get different kinds of support. So he imagined that fighting communism would be in the best interest. And he wanted war. He really, really wanted war. He believed, and this was really interesting to me, that he understood pushing down the, the black consciousness movement he under, and, and moving. He got this organization in Europe that was sending money to support the black consciousness movement. He got them to stop supporting the black consciousness movement and start supporting the ANC. And he thought that that was really one of his best accomplishments of his life's work. Because he felt like the black consciousness movement, we don't know how to handle it. It could lead to anything. If we have a widespread change in thinking amongst the black population and an unknown rebellion in various directions, we don't know how to handle that. But we have a very strong military and we're ready to fight a war. So if we can push everybody into the war, then we'll fight them. Yeah. So that was Craig Williamson. Tell us more about the Pretoria bombing, the MK attack of the May 20th, 1983, targeting the South African Air Force, and also with the schools involved in this. So I can't prove that one way or the other. So I spent time in the British National Archives looking through the papers of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Mm -hmm. And the papers are already redacted, so Every time they're talking about where they're getting information from, it's blacked out, right? But, I mean, we have to imagine that they're in communication with the South African government and they're getting intelligence from the South African state. But they don't admit it. And there's a set of folders in that archive that are blocked from public access. Even though we're talking about a story in the 80s and it should be after the time frame that the papers should be available to the public. I applied for permission to open those files. The reasoning I was told why I can't look at them is because it may be embarrassing to foreign governments or something. I tried to explain to them that foreign government is abolished. It doesn't exist anymore. The apartheid government is gone and has been discredited as a crime against humanity. You don't have to protect their feelings in any kind of way. But I didn't succeed in that. There's more there, I know. There's more to understanding what the South Africans understood, the, the government understood, and, and how they were giving that information. But anyway, in some kind of way, they sent information. The, the British believed that Marius Goon was somehow implicated in that bombing. Now, I spent a lot of time interviewing close comrades and friends of the Schoons who were there with him in Botswana, and I tried to nail down in some kind of a way 
what really was their role. Because the thing that I'm sure they were doing is a, a project called Internal Reconstruction and Development. So that should be about rebuilding a political underground here in, inside South Africa and, and making sure that there's a way to get information out about that. That's politics. That's not guns or soldiers. That's politics. But some of the people who knew them closely said probably they did work with MK. I interviewed Barbara Hogan. Barbara Hogan said that she was asked by Marius to set up safe houses for MK soldiers and she was very uncomfortable with that because she told them, I don't want to get involved in armed struggle. So, it can't be confirmed, I don't think. If someone knows, it's, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Their commanding officer in the ANC structures has passed away, and, um, and there, but there are other people who may know and, and either wouldn't talk to me or aren't talking at all, it's not clear. And Billy, how did the operations of the ANC in exile result in a continual blurring of the lines between political work and military work? Yeah, okay, so you hear in the way that I'm answering that this is this kind of blurring of the lines. And that was something that I was thinking about a lot and paying attention to a lot. So, okay, so if you have someone, let's take someone I interviewed who's, okay, man named Mike Khan, he was in the ANC for a long time, and he got a job as a physics lecturer at the University of Botswana. They give him housing for that, and so he agrees to use this comfortable house that he has to house MK soldiers going either north or south. That's a task in support of the armed struggle. It's very clear. And in certain people's definition, that definitely means that you're involved in the armed struggle. But he would say, no, I didn't, I didn't receive military training. I didn't take any specific oath as a member of Unconto Isizwe. Certainly I put myself in a certain kind of risk and I w was in support of the armed struggle. So, that's one that's even a bit more clear and already it starts to fall apart to figure out where the line exists with that. People told me that Maria Schoon was sent to Angola to receive military training in the MK camps, mm -hmm. but then they would say, but they call it like a crash course, like we have a certain kind of training which is just uh, self-defense or something or like a lower level training. So I didn't meet anyone who said, okay, he's definitely a soldier. I, even, even people who said maybe he was involved in military work, they imagined it was mostly talking politics mm -hmm. to people who are getting military training. And, and there's many different positions there about if you're talking politics in, an, in a military camp, does that give you an armed role or not? Why this matters, Can I, I mean, why I spend so much time worrying about this? is because of the way the Truth and Reconciliation Commission framed the criteria for amnesty. That, that, that's where this, all these muddy questions became somehow very important. Because Craig Williamson had to prove that he was telling the truth. Okay, that's one thing. He tells the truth. And, but the other thing is that he has a political motive for the murder. And there are many people who are close to Jenny and Marius who said, he doesn't have a political mo motive. He just hates her. He wants to kill her. And he knew her for a long time. Mm -hmm. he, he visited their house while they were in Botswana. He knew them. He really, really knew them. So they, and also they would say, the murder of a six-year-old girl, m you know, you can't talk about that any kind of way and say there's a political motive of that. There's no political motive to murder a young girl. But anyway, he, he needed to say that it had a polit political motive. And how do you do that? He offered two different kinds of motives. One was to say, in the same application, he has two totally different motives. One is to say, they are key personnel for the African National Congress, and we're fighting a war in Angola, and so we target key personnel. So in order to counter that, the ANC has to say, no, they're not key. They're now completely uninvolved. That's the way they would talk about it. But the other motive he gave was just to say he wants to cause confusion and fear amongst the ranks and just destabilize the organization. And that motive, to me, it sounds like terrorism. It sounds exactly like terrorism. And in that case, you, if you murder women and children, 
it doesn't, you're not actually thinking about what their role is in the organization. Mm -hmm. But because of the TRC, people were pushed into trying to prove one way or another that they are military or not military. And why was the British government determined to remove the schoons from Botswana? Also, why did Marie's school choose to have greater loyalty to the ANC than the international voluntary service that he worked for? Um, well, we have audio from Maria Schoon, which uh, is held here at these archives at, at WITS. And uh, he was interviewed in 1990 or 91. And he describes being told by the British that his life was in danger and that's why he had to leave Botswana. And that was a very compelling story and all the different people that I met that knew the Schoons, they said the same story. They, they had been carrying that for a long time. And when I got to the British archives, I found, no, that was just a lie that the British told them that uh, in order to move them out. Mm -hmm. But they actually spent from the moment they were hired by this British organization until they left Botswana, they were constantly pushing the organization to get rid of them. Um, they viewed the ANC as a ter terrorist organization, and so they viewed... To be clear, there's a lot in this book uh, and in the different actors in the story. There's a, the, there's a lot of sexism in, the, in various layers of what's happening here. So one is, there's all the time, from various different angles, people are separating Marius and Jeanette in how they think about them. Okay, so if you look, so I'm combining the, both of them, because I consider both of them to be committed political activists and they were deeply involved for their whole lifetime. But if you read the Foreign and Commonwealth Office papers, they virtually never mention her. They talk only about Marius. They say, Mar Marius, Marius, Marius. So Marius is a terrorist in the way that they describe. And this, this language we have now that we're much more familiar with the last 20 years or so, the idea of a war on terror and we don't harbor terrorists and so forth. So they refused to give them asylum based on the idea that that would be harboring terrorists or something. Yeah, and the question of loyalty, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, I think they would have taken the work in the UK if they still had a contract with that organization, they could have continued on. Jenny's sister was there, she had an Irish passport. There were ways they could have done it. However, while preparing to return home from exile, Marais expressed criticism and regrets about the ANC. So why was this? Uh, <laughs> because I, my sense, uh, after going to Angola and talking to people who lived there during that time and also speaking to, uh, I met with one man who, I mean, it wasn't like a formal interview. He didn't want to uh, speak in real depth who was also in the ANC and stationed in Lubango at that time. Mm -hmm. I think there were other people there. I don't know how many, I don't know how long, I don't know what they were all doing, but I don't think it was just this one family that was sent to Lubango. So I think it was a group of people from the ANC. The conditions of life there were very, very difficult in, in real ways. They'd already had, by the time the schoons arrived, they'd already had near, more than 20 years of war in Angola. and. It was civil war by the time that they were there. South African military was stationed there. So all of that was very, very tense, very difficult. And they were also being isolated in different ways. Um, as a socialist state, uh, the Portuguese had done a lot, a lot of intentional destruction of the society when they were leaving. Um, they did things like taking the blueprints for buildings away with them, taking the manuals for lifts, and to make it very difficult for the new independent country to govern themselves. And the white Portuguese left, like almost to the man, like the, almost everyone left. So like this college that they were at had been, all of the professors had left at once, and so they were rebuilding everything. Anyway, so the, all, there was something I think exciting about that in a certain way. It was this very international group of people and there's this thinking around international solidarity and we're making a new socialist society. Um, but there was also quite a bit of hardship, I think. It was just very difficult to obtain food in a very basic way and you have these small children there, you have to worry about that.
And earlier on, Billy, you talked about Craig Williamson's amnesty. So do you think individuals like him should have been denied amnesty for the deadly actions that they took in defending apartheid? Yeah, I think he should have been denied amnesty. I can say that really clearly now. I mean, I really thought about it. And I'm, and I'm really concerned that people will read this book and somehow misunderstand me because I've, I've gone through this effort to try to understand Craig Williamson, to try and track his thinking. I think it's important to understand him. I want to understand what apartheid was and what, how it worked. But I'm not excusing him in any way. I think he is a murderer and I think he's gotten away with it really quite. And he committed the murders. So this murder happened in Angola. He murdered Ruth first in Mozambique. He participated in the bombing of the ANC's headquarters in London. Uh, so those are all crimes that took place outside of South Africa. And the Truth Commission, if you read their report, they were very careful to explain. We can give him amnesty inside South Africa. We can talk about, we can even give him amnesty for the crimes he committed outside. But he committed those crimes outside of South Africa and other countries can make their own decisions about holding him accountable. And the other thing that I'm starting to think about more, is, uh, for example, like his wife, like what was his wife's role in all of this? She went with him to Geneva, she lived with him there. Uh, I found in the ANC archives, I found that Craig Williamson wrote to the ANC and said, my wife, she wants to study medicine because she wants to serve the people of South Africa and power to the people and all of this. And they wrote her a letter of recommendation to help get her into medical school. Um, so that's shocking to me. But so what was her role? What, how, how did she fit in with the project of working for the state? She has no amnesty. So I hope that there are some paths for justice that are still open and available. And lastly, Billy, you previously wrote a book, Choosing to be Free, a biography of Rick Tanner. So what is the comparison between those two stories? Um, in a way, I've, I've thought a lot about that and I think that there's, okay, on the most surface level is that they're both stories of political assassinations of white activists. But beyond that they were murdered, I mean, I came to this project first of all from a letter to the editor that Rick Turner's mother wrote after he was murdered. Mm -hmm. And it was called The Fate of the Band Eight. In 1973, there were a group of eight white activists from New Sass and eight black activists from Sasso. They were all placed under banning orders at the same time. So she talked about, my son has been murdered, but what happened to the other seven whites that she was talking about? Okay, some, multiple of them ended up in exile in different ways or, or cracked under the pressure of the banning order in certain ways. So my first idea was just to track down those people so it turns out, so one of those that was banned at the same time was Jenny Curtis's brother. And a number of the other ones were living in the same house as her at the time. So she came up through that same student movement that went through. The black consciousness movement did a very important thing to, to condemn white liberalism as, as being not a legitimate commitment to ending racialism, really. They don't really mean it. And and so that set in motion a whole series of changes and discussions within white people who were opposing apartheid. And it, it pushed them away from liberalism and to start to radicalize in different ways. For some of them, it, it led them to work closely with black consciousness. And in some of them, it actually, they ended up going away from black consciousness, even though they were trying to take it seriously. Okay, so that's interesting. But they were all part of that same, uh, trajectory. But the major difference uh, that makes working on the book and the whole reception of the book also very, very different is that Rick Turner was very, very careful. He didn't believe in clandestine activity. He wasn't interested. He was not a pacifist, but he didn't believe, he didn't want to build his politics around uh, going underground. So working on this project was a major difference for me to learn all of this about how the underground operates. And 
I hope that I've done a good job of presenting the different layers of how that looks, but there's some real limitation to doing it, which is that people made deep commitments to holding secrets, and in order to protect one another, they also really didn't tell each other certain very basic details. Like, when they're in Botswana and they feel like they really must leave, and where should we go next? I think under normal circumstances you would speak to your closest friends about that and you would talk it through and you would make it sense. But in the conditions of the underground in exile, it would be dangerous to try and talk about those kind of decisions. So people are, are, are not being evasive, but they quite literally don't know a lot of important details because they were really committed to not telling each other those things. So that's been a very new layer of the work. But I hope that this book at least opens up new conversations and maybe people will start to tell different stories that didn't make it into the book. That was Billy Keniston speaking to Crimea Media's Polity about apartheid spies and the revolutionary underground.